One second, I'm gonna fix the mic. I think it's working. Hold on. Okay. I'm recording. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. This is the start to uh, the Windows week. Um, Windows are really important, important part of competitions. Uh, every single year or every single semester and every single competition, I am the only person who does all of Windows. And it's like half the competition a lot of the time. So I'm graduating and I need someone to take over for me next year. Right. So basically, the point of this talk is not only to talk, talk to you about like how important Windows is and how to use it and how to on Monday, we're going to show you how to hack it. Tuesday is going to be how to defend it. But it's also to basically have one of you replace me. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to try my best to make you good. And that's that's what this talk is. So here's the schedule, right? Intro to Windows and Active Directory today. Uh, tomorrow is red or sorry, Monday is red team, right? and Tuesday's blue team. I'm not gonna lie, I don't think today will be that interesting. It's just kind of the necessary stuff that you have to know in order to use Windows as a sysadmin, in order to hack it as a red teamer, in order to defend it as a blue teamer. Uh, but people, I'm gonna talk about stuff that a lot of people don't know today. So sorry if it's kind of boring. I hope it's still useful. Okay, so here, let's talk about why you care about Active Directory, right? Uh, pretty much every single enterprise runs Windows. It's like 88% of the operating system market and like 95% of the Fortune 500. It's really important. I hear a lot of people who are pen testers who are like, I don't do Windows. You know, it's kind of it's too hard or it's annoying. And when I hear that, I think it's the most ridiculous thing ever because 88% of the operating system market share is Windows. Also, sorry? Exactly. As Michael says, you cannot do a pen test without Windows. Uh, a lot of people talk about how servers are primarily Linux. That's true. But typically, as pen testers and, when we're, and defenders, we are not concerned about the servers that have been hardened and are, by use, are only used by like IT admins. We are concerned by the computers that are being used by users who don't know any better and who are going to install malware and do dumb stuff. And uh, that's why Windows is a really, really big target. Um, so it's important to know. Uh, here's proof of that, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember the CrowdStrike incident over the summer. Uh, pretty much, I don't know, the majority of the Fortune 500 companies went down because of Windows. Flights were being grounded, hospitals weren't working, um, you couldn't check out in stores. Uh, here's some proof of that. Here's a photo on the left of an airport. On the right is a Nike store. You can see the Windows blue screen of death, right? Uh, I went to places and they were like, sorry, we can't check you out. We have to do it manually, cash only, whatever, right? Sorry, you can't fly. Uh, sorry, we can't find your baggage for two weeks, you know? Uh, Windows is everywhere on every system. Tons of kiosks at Publix and Walmart and whatever run Windows. Uh, it's very important to know. So here's my goal for you, right? A lot of people, they prefer Linux, you know? They just only stick with Linux. They only stick with web. That's okay. But my hope is some of you take the red pill and you decide, put in the effort. I know it's kind of annoying. I know Windows is hard. Put in the effort. Windows, if you kind of get over that learning curve, is really easy. And you can get a lot of, lot of good juicy stuff. Yeah? <laughs> I think Windows is a fantastic operating system. I'm not biased at all in any way. I, there's a there's a Microsoft logo on my hoodie. I, I think Windows is fantastic. It's there's a lot of really great security features. Even though I use Linux, Windows is like the best for enterprise. Uh, period, because you can control users and groups and that kind of thing. UF uses Active Directory, and they use Windows pretty much exclusively. Right? They also have Linux on their Active Directory. And I'll, if you don't know what AD is, Active Directory is, I'll explain it. But Windows is very good to know. Yeah. 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 It's good to know. Especially when it's uh, 
skill, remember I told you a lot of pen testers, they refuse to learn Windows. You're in a slightly more niche market because it's a little bit harder, but I promise once you learn it, it's so easy. Once you learn it, okay? Uh, Active Directory in Windows is famously very, very vulnerable. It's very, very complicated. It's an operating system that's like 25 years old or plus. And the code base is like hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of just code. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of misconfigurations. Very often, Microsoft itself will publish you know, guidance on how to use a tool or a service, and their guidance will cause vulnerabilities. They'll be like, we suggest that you do this thing. And companies listen, and it makes things vulnerable. Uh, so that's why I love Windows. It's just so many vulnerabilities everywhere. It's great. All right, so here's, here's why this talk is important. Okay? You can do Windows pen testing and Windows defense and Windows security research, a little bit less the last thing, without understanding anything. But if you really want to be good at it, you really want to make it easy for yourself. You have to understand the basics and you have to really understand the internals. Uh, if you really want to do like vulnerability research, you really want to understand Windows, I highly recommend this book by James Forshaw called Windows Securities Internals. It's pretty long, it's pretty beefy, but it's very interesting and it's written very well, I think. Um, it's a good book to pick up once you've already learned all the basics. So let's talk about the basics. Uh, here's the file system, right? Um, if you're familiar with Linux, it's like the same thing, except instead of forward slashes, you use backslashes. Uh, the root of the file system in Windows is C colon backslash, right? Everything's in there. And pats are case insensitive. They can be uppercase or lowercase, and they don't require quotes, quotes, kinda, right? Windows automatically will resolve path names, or they'll, it'll try to uh, if you don't have quotes. And that is the cause of some vulnerabilities, but it's useful. Uh, some important paths to note, this is after Windows Vista, is the user's path, that's where user data is. Program files is where things you install are. System32 is system things, things that are important for the operating system. And program files x86 is 32-bit or x86 uh, files. The registry is like a custom file system in Windows where all the settings are stored. So in Linux, everything is a file. Right? Everything's a text file, everything's configured in a file. In Windows, they have their own kind of database, essentially, that they call a registry. That includes a lot of settings about different Windows programs, about Windows functionality. If you want to make your RDP, or if you want to, I don't know, make your computer uh, screen upside down, you go in the registry key. If you want to make things more secure or less secure, you go in the registry key. If you want programs to be able to run immediately after they crash and get, I don't know, Everything is in the registry. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of info about how to read it. Right? So some of you might have used the tool RegEdit, Registry Editor. Uh, everything in Windows registry is in this thing called a handle to a key. They have these things called hives. That's what they call the database. And HKCU, handle to key cur for the current user, uh, is settings for the current user. HKLM is for the local machine. So if you want to make settings that change the whole entire system, you do HKLM. Uh, there's different types of values. There's a D word, double word, Q word, quad word. There's 32 and 64 bit numbers. SZ is a string. Uh, and every single thing is just like key value, key value, key value in a bunch of folders. Any questions about that? This is the kind of thing that's not that interesting until you need to change stuff to make things vulnerable in a pen test, or you need to change things to more, make things more secure when you're doing defense. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. It's like something, 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 underscore SC. I think SC means a string and then null terminated, which means it ends with a zero byte. OK. Uh, for command line shells, the original one that some of you may have used is called cmd.exe. This uses like executables. So cmd.exe is, is, is an executable. So it is who so is who am I dot exe. Um, and it's like really really old, kind of OG. Um, and there's a lot of like internal commands that are built into CMD. Now this isn't used so often anymore because of PowerShell.exe, which is more modern. Um, it has a kind of object-based notation where every single output of command of a command is like an object you can extract fields from, which I think is pretty nice compared to 
Linux Bash. Uh, and it uses this thing called commandlets, which calls .NET. .NET is an API in Windows that will let you control like anything that Windows does. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And a terminal, the terminal is like this relatively new Microsoft Windows product uh, that allows you to have multiple tabs and allows you to have multiple shells like cmd.exe, powershell.exe. You can have your Azure, CLI, et cetera. Uh, it's nice to use. So PowerShell commands are called commandlets. Uh, yeah? Why is it still there? So Microsoft notoriously refuses to remove functionality from anything. Uh, they want everything to be backwards compatible, such that if you develop an app in 2010, it should still work in 2025. Um, and eventually, they decided to actually deprecate things. Uh, I learned recently that Internet Explorer is going to be still supported until 2029. Uh, that's because they refuse to deprecate things, because money talks and companies don't want to upgrade their software. So they're like, OK, we'll continue supporting stuff, including cmd.exe. Uh, fun fact, they didn't actually want to create PowerShell.exe, but they did because I think it was some military standard or something uh, required them to. And they were like, we don't want to do this, but I guess we'll do it. And then everyone was like, PowerShell is way better. And it's, it's, continuing, it's continually updated. So they're constantly adding new commandlets, which are their versions of like commands. Um, everything in PowerShell is verb noun syntax. So get child item is list <laughs> files, or you know get. It's everything's a tree, right? So it's like get all the children, i.e. ls. Get content is cat. Invoke expression calls an expression like a command. Uh, they also have really really specific stuff like start vm, stop vm, whatever. It's it's pretty cool. Whatever you want to do. There's probably a PowerShell commandlet for it. Uh, and it's very, very highly integrated into Windows APIs, which means it can manage pretty much everything. I said VMs, files, users, services, apps, registry keys. Uh, so it's very useful if you have PowerShell on your machine. You sometimes won't in competitions, but it's great. Yep. You can get custom commandlets. I don't really know how the built-in things works. Like, there's a lot of default ones. You can also make your own. You can also make aliases. So, like on PowerShell, because nobody wants to remember get child item. You can also use GCI, which is a shortcut. And LS is aliased to get child item because everyone comes from Linux and everyone's used to LS. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. So, so th they're claiming that they're gonna. They're going to stop supporting Windows 10. Uh, nobody believes it. <laughs> um, they claim they're going to stop support for Windows 10 in almost exactly a year. And nobody believes it because currently like 60% of the market is on Windows 10. Uh, they're just trying to push people onto Windows 11. Um, anyway, I, you know, I have like 50 slides and I was like, I'm going to get through that in half an hour. And I might not. Uh, if you want to learn PowerShell, there's a... If you've ever done over the wire for Linux, there's a PowerShell version called under the wire, which I actually think is better because uh, it actually teaches you useful stuff. That's an unpopular opinion, but you can try that. It's nice for learning PowerShell. But to be honest, I think PowerShell is the kind of thing where you just kind of learn as you go. You don't have to study it. You know, just use it whenever you need to. And uh, if you want to learn more from Windows fundamentals, there's a good try hack me room. Okay. Now let's talk about the basics of Active Directory. This is something that most of you, I assume, probably don't know because it's not really used on personal computers. Uh, this is used in enterprises, and it's used in a lot of our competitions because we pen test and defend fake enterprises. Uh, Microsoft Directory Services is what a lot of people are referring to when they talk about Active Directory, uh, ADDS. And it's a tool that will basically allow you to put users into groups, will allow those users to have permissions, uh, will have properties for computers and groups and users and containers and stuff like that. Uh, and it's a vastly complex system that works best with Windows because, you know, same creator, uh, which is why Windows is the go-to operating system for enterprises. It does also work with Linux and Mac OS, but there's a lot of really interesting intricacies that can break that 
Uh, and sometimes there's vulnerabilities caused by you using Active Directory on Linux if you don't do it correctly. And sometimes it just doesn't work as well. Yeah. I'll talk about that soon. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of chart of what Active Directory looks like. So UF has its own kind of organization uh, where we have a forest that is like the all the UF domains. In this case, a domain would be like, you know, Shans would have something. And so would the UF, like, I don't know, uh, group in South Florida, because UF is all over the state, right? And then inside of that, you would have a group for users, or you would have a group for students, or you would have a group for like freshmen, something like that. And each one of them is gonna have their own permissions. Um, Here's some basics about it. One second. Uh, a forest, so I'll start with a domain. A domain is just a grouping of users, right? At UF, it's called ufl.edu. Don't mix it up with like the web domain because you can have a domain that's google.com and separately you kind of have an Active Directory domain that's probably going to be under the same name, but it might not be. Uh, the domain controller is like the server that controls that, right? You can have multiple domain controllers. UF has like 20 to 60, I think. Um, and... Uh, each of those domain controllers is supposed to be synced at all times, and each one can represent its own domain or like the same domain, and you can have groups of domains for like, sometimes companies will make a new branch in Europe, and they're like, let's make the Europe branch, and we have the US branch, and those are two separate domains in the same forest. And then users are just users, groups are groups of users, and policies are like, the rules you apply to the users. When can the user log in? How long does their password have to be? Uh, like. Are they allowed to install stuff on the computer? That kind of thing. Questions? Yeah? No. Did I write that? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. So a domain is a group of all the things. We just call them objects. Right, so users, machines, OU is an organizational unit, which is basically a group. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're they're roughly the same. Okay, uh, if you want to learn about Active Directory basics, oh yeah, yeah, um, a tree is a grouping of domains, and a forest is a bunch of trees. You know, it's it's a little bit hard to explain without a good example, and the only example I know is UF. <laughs> um, but this room covers it well. No, it's just, that's it. It's just forest, tree, domain, groups, users, properties. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the stuff that I think is a little bit more interesting. Um, so on Active Directory, you're probably familiar when you log in on your computer, you have an account, right? If you're logging in on your personal computer, that's just a local account, period. You log in, some computer checks the hash against the hash in a database on your own computer, and that's it. There's also domain login. So your UF account, your at UFL, and that you log into with computers and onto websites and that st kind of stuff, that's a domain account. And every time you log in, it's likely going to contact the domain controller and it's going to say, hey, here's the credentials that this user sent me. And it's going to respond and say, yes, you are allowed to have access to these services. No, you're not. Um, so every computer like over here, all of them have local accounts and all of them also have domain accounts. And by default, it's going to log into the domain account, but you may also have local accounts. Uh, passwords also might be the same. Sometimes they are when we do competitions, but they shouldn't be because password reuse is bad. Uh, on a computer, there's kind of three accounts that I think you have to worry about. So there's like normal user accounts, but there's also different levels of privileges. Um, local system and NT authority system are like a local admin. It's an admin on the local computer and you only have access to the resources on that computer. System is local admin, but you can think of it as like a little bit closer to the kernel, slightly higher privileges. I don't really know what the privileges are to be honest because it's never impacted anything I've done, but it's slightly higher privileges. And then domain admin is admin of everyone. 
right? Uh, it's of like every single user, every single computer, and you can have multiple domain admins, and you can also have a single administrator account on the domain. Questions? Yeah. What you said? What's the difference between a local account and? No, every account doesn't have a local admin. Every account, so there's there's local users on a computer. Most of these computers probably only have one user. They probably only have administrator because they're not intended to be used separate from the domain. That's my guess, right? And those are users that you can log into without any internet, without any connection to the network, right? It's just on the computer. And then you have a bunch of domain users, and that would be your, like, name at ufl.edu, right? And the reason it works with like your one.uf and also your canvas and also your, you know, the computers is because it's on the domain, connects to the domain controller and it'll be like, hey, here's the password. Do I get access, right? Oh, I'm reading this right now. I, I think there's a little typo in there. Are you talking about the top line? Th that should that should say <laughs> sorry. That should say every computer on Windows, or every computer, I guess, has a local admin and local users. Uh, and then yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, Andre. Your personal computer. That's not a thing. Yeah, not Windows. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to have to speed run a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about credentials. Windows has a long history of different types of logging in and different hashing types. Here's a list. Uh, LM is the LAN manager. Uh, you don't have to worry about what that means. That's like the really, really old hash. It's extremely weak, and it's extremely easy to turn into a password to crack. Um, it's mostly unused. This hash I have here, AAD3B43, et cetera, uh, is one that I have like the prefix of wish memorized because it is always, or sorry, it's the null hash. It's a hash of nothing. And Windows uses this all the time nowadays because LM is just no longer in usage. But they still have it for backwards compatibility. Uh, the NT hash is like more modern. It stands for new technology, and it's like the equivalent of a password in Windows. It's not as weak as LM, but it's still pretty weak, and it's still relatively easy to crack. Uh, you can see here I have UFSIT hashed with NT, uh, becomes 272AE, et cetera. Um, and this is, the reason I say it's equal to a password is because, you know, the hashing in Windows is interesting. So on a website, you might imagine that when you log in with a password, the password gets turned into, into a hash, and the hash gets compared. But you can't log in with a hash, right? You only log in with a password. In Windows, you log in with the hash. The front end like turns your password into a hash, but they just use the hash to log into everything, which means that if your hash password hashes leak on a website, the person has to crack the hash, turn it into a password, in order to log in. For Windows, you don't need to. If you get a password hash, an NT hash in particular, you can just log in with that. You don't have to figure out what the password is. Does that make sense? Do people know what password cracking is? Do they understand that idea? Turning a hash into a password? Yeah? Um, I have no idea, actually, because I'm pretty sure LM was extinct by the time I was born. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's correct. If the service allows or accepts NT hashes. What does it do? Just compares the hash with its database. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. You log in with just a hash. 
directly. I'll talk about it a little bit later. I'm way too behind. Uh, now, Windows eventually created what they call the NTLM hash. You'll notice it's a combination of the LM hash and the NT hash. I don't know why it's called LMNT. It's called NTLM, even though the order is LM and then NT. And you'll notice it's just a combination of a null LM hash, a hash of nothing, and an NT hash of your password. And this is what Windows uses nowadays. It's almost always pretty much like 99.99% .99 of the time you're going to have a null LM hash, which is like AAD, 3B, etc. Uh, yes. Why? Backwards compatibility. That's it. Um, now, when you're doing network authentication, we don't use NTLM. We use NetNTLM v1, which is the network NTLM. Uh, v version 1 was Windows' attempt at using NTLM for network authentication. Unfortunately, the cryptography was bad, and it's vulnerable in such a way that you can turn your NTLM v1 hash into an NTLM hash, which, remember, you can log in with an NTLM hash. So that's bad. Uh, then they made net NTLM v2, which seems to be secure, but it's still crackable. Right? Every hash is like crackable. It's just a matter of how long it takes. This one's pretty fast. So if you happen to capture an NTLM v2 hash, and you can figure out like a password list or something, you can crack it and turn it into a password. Kerberos is another authentication protocol that happens over the network. I will talk about that later. Any questions about this slide? Yes. Why? Why, like the design of that? I think, I think it was just dumb design, to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, Oh, you know what? I think I, I think I do know why. It's for purposes of like single sign-on. So on Windows, when you log into your computer and you try to access a resource, you don't have to log in over and over and over again. And that's because it saves the hash rather than the password. Uh, and then it forwards the hash along in order to log into things. Uh, in the words of Mark Rusinovich, who is this big guy at Microsoft who does a lot of stuff, uh, it's a feature, not a bug. Okay, uh, here's some more credential things. These are not types of hashes, but rather these are services and files in Windows that store credentials. SAM is a security account manager. It's part of the registry, and it's in HKLM, which if you remember is local machine. So these are hashes for the local computer. These are local users. Uh, it's also stored here, C Windows System32 config SAM. Uh, and if you can dump this file, if you can grab this file from a computer, you can grab all the NTLM hashes and you can do whatever you want with it. LSAS is the local security citizen service. And this is something that runs in memory. Whenever you log in, it takes your password and it stores it in memory. And it's going to take your NT hash, or your NTLM hash. And this is what will log you into stuff. Uh, and that's why I say it's crucial for SSO to work. It also includes other hashes. It'll uh, store Kerberos tickets, which I'll talk about later, which is just another type of authentication. Uh, and it only exists in memory, which means when the computer is off and you turn it back on, it's all gone. NTDS is the domain kind of credential score store. On every single domain controller, there's a file called ntds.dit, uh, which includes user information, group information, security descriptors, permissions, and also crucially for security people, NTLM hashes. So if you can find the ntds.dit file, you can find the hash for every single user on the domain. And you can log in as them and do whatever you want. Uh, and then LAPS is a kind of newer security solution that is meant to prevent uh, password stealing attacks and credential stealing attacks. It's basically a password manager for the domain. Uh, it can be on the cloud. It cannot be on the cloud. But how it works, it, it literally will like generate random passwords for things, save them online in a secure way. And uh, it's, it's good to have. Questions about this? OK. Yep. When they ask you to do a password change? Yes. Now, if you're talking about like a website, it's not going to be this. It's going to be like the website database. Uh, UF, the reason they ask you to change their password every year is not because things are getting leaked. It's just because they think it's good practice. I don't think it is. Most security professionals agree you shouldn't have to change your password repeatedly because it encourages people to create bad passwords but that could that's a possibility 
right? If, if somebody steals the ntds.dit file, you should have all of your users change their passwords. Okay. Uh, let's talk about services, right? So in Windows, uh, there's a lot of things that run in the background, and these are called services. A majority of them run as system. They run as like the highest privilege ever, which is really bad because if you can take over a service, you get the highest privilege ever. Uh, this, the reason it runs a system is because when Windows was being created in like 1997 or whatever, people were lazy and they were like, let me just use the highest privileges possible because it makes things easy. Slowly Windows is turning things into not things that are running a system. Remember systems like administrator, right? Slowly they're becoming less and less privileged, which is good because a lot of these services are vulnerable. But you'll have a service for like Wi-Fi. You'll have a service for, I don't know, logging in a service for your virtual machines. Uh, some games will install services in the background, uh, things like that. And they are just processes that run in the background, uh, basically just programs. Questions? A lot of them start at boot also, which makes them especially scary. Okay, so on a domain, there's these things called Windows identifiers. Every single object has an identifier that we call the SID, the security identifier. I don't really remember what all of these numbers mean because they're not particularly useful. Uh, but that thing that at the top is the domain SID. You can just think of it as the identifier for the entire domain. So ufl.edu has a SID. And then you'll notice that I also have an extra dash at the end, and you see 512. That extra thing at the end is going to be for every single user, group, object, whatever. So you can have identifiers for users and groups, and that thing at the end is what we call the relative identifier. So I'm pretty sure 500 is always the administrator, or maybe it's the guest account, and then like something, et cetera, et cetera. Users typically start at 1,000, uh, so you can be like my RID, my relative identifier, is 10,053. Right? And given a domain, that would identify a user, a group, whatever, a resource. Questions? Yeah? I have no idea. Uh, Andre asked if the numbers below 500 are reserved for something. I would assume that's the case. I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe. Let's see. OK. This is my favorite part of the talk, protocols. Now. There are a lot of protocols in Windows. Uh, Microsoft makes a spec for every single protocol, including a spec for the protocol overview that they called MSWPO. If you want to look at it, it's interesting. You're probably not going to understand any of it. I didn't understand most of it because there's a lot of really, really niche protocols for lots of different use cases. Um, I want to give you a preview. Here's the first page of the protocol spec. Here's the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And there's way too many protocols. <laughs> Uh, luckily, you don't have to know the majority of them. I'm going to cover like, how many am I going to cover? One, two, three, eight. Eight is not bad. Okay, You can learn eight protocols. These are like what I believe to be the important ones for Windows security and Active Directory security on a general domain. You might have to learn others. If you want to do like security research and vulnerability research and that kind of thing, I honestly really recommend finding a random protocol that nobody ever thinks about and looking for vulnerabilities. Because if you're like the first person to look at it, you will find vulnerabilities. And it's probably going to be for a service that runs in the kernel or runs as administrator, right? So you could, you could get a lot of cool bugs uh, if you pick like a random service. Um, but we're only going to cover eight of them. Uh, I thought I'd start with like what I believe to be probably the easiest, um, which is IIS. That's in Internet Information Services. Uh, this is a service that is all over UF. Uh, by the way, by the way, I should preface, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it at UF. When I was a freshman, I got in trouble for doing stuff on the domain that I shouldn't have, and IT got really mad at me, and they were like, you're gonna get, you're gonna get expelled if you continue. So I stopped. So I might talk about things, and I might forget to warn you, but my recommendation to you is don't go searching for things in suspicious ways. <laughs> don't use like hacker tools on the UF network because they will get mad at you and then they will get mad at me. So don't do it. But all over Shans, 
hospital. They have tons and tons and tons of web servers that is just have port 80 open and have IIS open. And these are web servers. And this is like the default page. This is the blank page. Um, and they are web servers that execute files of type ASPX, ASP, PHP, and like HTML and some other things. Um, but they're just web servers, right? That's all you need to know. You can host a website on there. You can host files, that kind of stuff. That makes sense, right? Pretty simple. Okay, good. Uh, the next one, this is something that you might not know about, uh, but it's incredibly important for all things Windows security, um, is SMB. SMB stands for server message block. And this is basically a remote file share, a remote folder, right? So you can access folders and files that are not on your computer and are on other computers via a network share. And that's what SMB is. Primary, well, that's what like users primarily use it for. It also does IPC, inter-process communication, if, if, if you've taken OS, uh, sysvol and netlogon, which I'll talk about later. But you can see here an example file. Every, you know, in Windows, it's C colon backslash for the root file system. If you want to access a network share, it's back, back, or we whack, whack. <laughs> IT is the share name. Adam here is the user, or sorry, the folder. And notes.txt is the file. Right? So you can have a lot of folders or whatever. But that first thing is going to be, you can think of it as like the, I guess it's a folder basically. right? But it's like over the network. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes, Andre? <laughs> Andre asked why the slashes are that direction. Um, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, you'll get used to it. Yeah, Windows will actually, because they try to be nice to people, will auto automatically fix your slashes. Um, yeah. But anyway, sysfall is something that stores, it's, it's one of the default SMB shares. So if you scan a computer, a domain controller, or a server, don't do this, by the way, unless it's like your own v virtual machine, right? But if you do that, you're going to see a bunch of file shares on like the domain controller, for example, one of which is called sysfall, and that stores like domain public files. And these are files that are going to get replicated to every single domain controller every like 24 hours or 48 hours or something like that. Net logon is a share that's pretty interesting. It in can include logon scripts and group policies, like policies for groups, uh, and can be used by computers, like any computer deployed to a domain. So users can have scripts that just start, that run on the computer immediately when you log in. Uh, and a lot of people will accidentally put credentials in there thinking that the file share is not public when sometimes it's public. Um, you can also put malware in there. You can, you shouldn't, unless it's like a, you know, fake competition, but uh, you can have a lot of stuff there. And the two pretty important things for like offensive security to note is that a lot of the, or sometimes you can have two types of authentication as opposed to like your user authentication where you log in with Adam and the password or whatever. You can have null authentication, which is when you have no username and no password that is enabled on some domain controllers, although not recently, it's pretty old. And you can have anonymous authentication, which is the guest account. You've all probably seen in your computers a guest account or some other computer on Windows before. That's when you have any username and no password. And these guest accounts, while not that privileged, have privileges, um, which is why they should be disabled. Uh, unless you're like a kiosk, you need someone to be able to log in. But even then, it's not really useful. Questions about that? OK. Okay, this is my favorite protocol. That's my favorite protocol because it's really hard and annoying. And after it being explained to me like six times, I still didn't understand it. But I think I understand it now. So I'm going to try to help you. Hopefully understand it quicker than I did. Right? Here's a tweet from Swift on Security. It says, one time I tried to explain Kerberos to someone, and then we both didn't understand it. Uh, this has happened to me where I thought I understood Kerberos, and I explained it to someone, and I realized I was wrong. So let's hope it doesn't happen today. Uh, Kerberos is one of those other authentication protocols I mentioned to you. So I talked to you about NTLM, the NTLM v1, the NTLM v2. Kerberos, it's still pretty old, it's like 20 years old, is Microsoft's attempt to make authentication secure. Right? So Kerberos is a protocol that was developed at MIT to be like, man, I forgot what it's called. It's like blind, what is it called? Zero trust, yeah. It's one of those things that's supposed to be zero trust. 
You're not supposed to trust anyone. It's still supposed to be secure. Uh, but Microsoft took it, and they got rid of a lot of good things, and they added some things that are useful, but they're, they cause vulnerabilities. And as a result, Kerberos causes a lot of, creates a lot of issues. Um, Kerberos, you can think of it as like single sign-on, right? Once you get access to a thing, you should be able to continue getting access. You've logged on once, and you should be able to continue getting access, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But it's like a more secure authentication protocol. Okay. So here's, here's some terms. You're probably going to forget them, but I'll, you know, I'll try to explain things with the terms. KDC is the Key Distribution Center. This is almost always on a main controller. And this is what everyone has to talk to to authenticate to stuff. So when you log on to the UF computers here, you log on to Canvas or something, it'll log you on, and it'll go and talk to some domain controller, and it'll be like, here's the password, username and password I got. Is it correct? And if it's correct, it'll get back to you. Now, all this happens with a service account. It's an account specifically made to do stuff in the background for a service called the KRB TGT account. And this is the service account that handles the Kerberos protocol. A TGT is a ticket granting ticket. And this is something that's given to a client once you've authenticated. That's how single sign-on works. When you log on, it gives you back a thing called the TGT and you keep it every time you want to get access to something because you kept the TGT, you just give it back to them. Does that make sense? I'll explain a little bit more later. Good, okay. The TGS is the ticket granting service. This is another service of the domain controller that accepts a ticket granting ticket and will allow you to access a service by giving you a service ticket. Can you see why people get confused by this? The tickets and the ticket granting tickets and the services. Yeah, one second. Uh, the service ticket is that thing that you use to gain access to a service, um, like SMB, for example, which we talked about. And the pack, this is the thing that Microsoft added to Kerberos. So Kerberos by itself was only supposed to be an authentication protocol. Can you log in? Microsoft wanted it to be more, so they added what's called a PAC, a Privileged Attribute Certificate, which also does authorization. It says, hey, you're logged in. Are you allowed to access the service? And it does that by including information about groups, permissions, and that kind of stuff. Andre? It's a blob of data. That's the official word. It's a blob. Um, anyway, here is that whole process that I talked about in a chart, in a graph, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from top to bottom, find the nearest TV to you so you can read it because I know it's small text, right? Uh, and I'll, hopefully we can understand it, right? So if I wanna log into something, let's say I log into the computer, I'm gonna send what's called a KRBAS request. That's the Kerberos authentication service or server request. It says, hey, I'm Adam Hassan, and I send with it my NTLM hash, uh, or rather, I send it a timestamp encrypted with my NTLM hash. Now, the domain controller, who remembers what the file that stores all the NTLM hashes is called? Uh, yeah? NTDS.dit, that's correct. They have all the hashes. So I encrypted my timestamp with my hash. So the domain controller, or rather the KRBTG service account, can say, hey, I have your hash, and you claim to be this person. Let me decrypt your timestamp. And it's going to say, hey, that timestamp is accurate and you are who you say you are. And if that is correct, it'll respond with what's called a ticket granting ticket. And this is a ticket that says, hey, I am this person. And it also includes the pack, which says these are the groups I'm in. These are the users I'm in, et cetera. These are very exploitable things. And I'll talk about that on Monday. But for now, we're going to talk about the intended usage, which is it just responds back and says, this is me. Okay. Now I have my TGT, I've logged in. Let's say I want to access a service. I want to access a web server, a file system, a file share, a database. I will send my TGT back to the domain controller with what's called an SPN. An SPN is a service principle name. Every single service has an SPN that has like the type of the service. So here you can see it's MSSQL. They'll have like a username and they'll have a domain and a port. Some of those things are not always going to be there, but it's basically the identifier for the service. So I send it my ticket granting ticket to be like, here is who I am. And I say, I want access to the service. And it'll respond. And I'm talking, by the way, to the ticket granting service on the domain controller. And the ticket granting service on the domain controller is going to respond with a service ticket. 
And this service ticket, you will always get access to it. You don't need to have permissions for the resource. It will always respond with a service ticket that allows me to try to authenticate to the service. So now I have my service ticket. And what I do with that is I send it to the service. Here I'm trying to access the MS SQL service on this domain. So I send it my service ticket and it looks at the pack inside and it says you are in the administrator group. So you are allowed access. Or it says you are not in the database manager group. So you are not allowed access. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And if it decides that I'm allowed access, it responds and it says, okay, you can access my resources. That makes sense? Okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> now, when I, when I first learned about Kerberos, I needed it to be explained by like five different people. And only after the fifth time did I fully understand it. So here's an analogy. Oh, here's an analogy I like, right? Uh, here's the carnival analogy. This really like, really made me understand it, okay? So when you go to a carnival, a lot of the time you'll, get, like, you'll, you'll pay, and you'll get a wristband to say, I'm allowed inside this carnival. And that ticket stand is going to be the KD, KDC, the K Distribution Center, that will do all the things. And the wristband is the TGT. The wristband is the thing that says, I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to be in the domain. I'm allowed to be in the carnival. When I want to play a game, I show them my ticket, or my wristband, rather, my TGT. And the game here is the service, right? So I go, hey, I, uh, here's my TGT. Can I get an ST, a service ticket? And it'll give me back tickets, in this case, like carnival tickets, that allow me to play the game. And then when I actually want to play the game, I give them the ticket that I got. Uh, and they go, OK, cool. You have the ticket. You're allowed to play the game. That makes sense? Yeah? So say that again. Yes, so the question is, does a TGT have a timeout? On Windows, by default, the expiry for a TGT is 10 hours. Uh, fun fact, a lot of pen testing tools, by default, create the TGT timeout for like 10,000 hours. Uh, so it's really easy to detect attacks if pen testers are being dumb, which a lot of them are, including me, because, you know, most of the time, Nothing's going to happen when you try to use a TGT that expires in 10,000 hours. But if a domain is smart, and if the people who set it up are smart, it is detectable. Questions? Yes. So you can have services on a domain controller. But a lot of the time, especially in big domains, you will have services separate. So you'll have a specific computer for the database and a specific computer for the web server. Um, and then it's also a bad idea to have services running on the domain controller because if these services are exploited, you immediately get access to the main controller and the ntds.dit file on that. Okay. So that's that again. I'm not going to go over it again. Uh, feel free to ask me questions if you need help understanding. Okay. Uh, here's another one. DNS is domain name system. Um, this is actually necessary for Kerberos to work. If you're unfamiliar with DNS, it's something that takes a host name and resolves it to an IP address. So ufl.edu resolves to something. Uh, ad.ufl.edu resolves to something, et cetera, et cetera. And Kerberos, while NT and NTLM will work with IP addresses, Kerberos will only work if you provided a domain name. Um, now, everything in Windows has a domain, even computers that are not what we call domain joined, not on the domain. For local computers, it's called work group. If you ever see that, that just means not on a domain. And for everything else, it's going to look like a website. I have a domain called adam.local. Uh, that's kind of like if you have a virtual machine, most people call it .local. But you don't have to. Call it whatever you want. UF's domain is ufl.edu. And it's important to note, people confuse this a lot. It's different from the website. It's usually like named the same thing, but it might not be. Questions about that? OK. Uh, the next one is called LDAP. This is another really critical protocol for Active Directory. It's called the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. You'll realize there's a lot of ports. Uh, the reason is because port 389 is the unencrypted version, and 636 is the encrypted version. And 3268 and 69 are also encrypted, but in different ways. I don't really know how. 
But LDAP is essentially a database of objects in Active Directory. So I told you that Active Directory stores all this information about users and groups. All of that is in LDAP. And you can think of it kind of like a big database that's like a tree, right? So the root of the tree is the domain. So here I have lab local. Uh, for UF, the domain would be DC equals AD comma DC equals UFL comma DC equals EDU. And that's like the root. And that's called the distinguished name for the domain, which is like where you can find an object in a tree. So this is a tool. By the way, I have in big red text. Don't be dumb because it's really easy to do dumb stuff, especially when you're interacting with a UF domain. Here's a tool for enumerating LDAP on domains. And here you can see all the information about me. Uh, you can see my username, my phone number, which I blurred out. Uh, you can see my email. You can see my permissions when the user was created, uh, and all of my groups. Every single you, every class I've taken is there. Every room I have permission to is there. Uh, the computer science, you know, you know, I can print in the computer science lab. That's because I'm in the computer science students group, right? Um, here's, <laughs> I don't recommend doing this if you don't know what you're doing. But the tool that I use to do this is GoDap. Uh, I also have a repo for. Filters you can use to search. If you see at the top, you can see I'm looking for Sam account name equals Adam Hassan. Uh, that's just like the attribute that LDAP uses to look things up. And so I looked for the account called Adam Hassan. Um, now I want to warn you that this tool has a lot of pre-made queries. And if you run the queries, UF is going to email you and they're going to be mad at you. So you have to know what you're doing, which is why I recommend you don't do it. But I thought I'd show you because I think it's really cool. And this is how I found out a lot of interesting things about the UF domain. And I've gotten a lot of inspiration about how to secure things by looking at the UF domain. Questions? Yeah? Well, uh, you, they would have to have different usernames. You can't have the same username in the same domain. So like, you know, when you sign up for your email at UF, you're also signing up for your domain user account. So that's my, my email is adamhassan at ufl.edu, right? Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so LDAP by default will let you read everything, including phone number, if you live on campus, your address, uh, stuff like that. Now, by default in a domain, all of that is accessible to any user in the domain. UF has made it non-default such that I cannot see everybody's address and I cannot see many people's username or sorry phone numbers assuming they opted out of that. I can see my own. So this is I can see everything about me and this is everything about me. There's about 5 or 250 groups. I'm not showing you all of them, but there's a lot of them. Questions? Okay. Uh, MS SQL, I talked about databases, you kind of got a preview of this, is Microsoft's version of a database. It's Microsoft Structured Query Language, uh, and it's pretty much the same, right? Syntax is pretty much the same, except there's a lot of extra features because Microsoft likes to add extra features to make things easier. Uh, but the features also make things easier to exploit. So for example, you can get code execution on MS SQL with a query called XP. Man, I forgot what it is. I don't know what it is, but you can execute stuff if you're an administrator or if it's misconfigured. Uh, now, there's two types of authentication. This is important to note for when you're logging into stuff. There's Windows authentication, which is use, uses your domain account, which is actually the non-default type of authentication. And there's also SQL authentication, which is only for the users in the database, which you can query. right? And if you have access to it, you can query the hashes and that kind of thing. Uh, this is something that a lot of people who set up IIS, remember that website, uh, will use MS SQL together with it. Um, it's like the default database on Windows. Questions about that? OK. Let's see. Oh, is that the last slide? There's like two more slides, I think. Uh, RDP is Remote Desktop Protocol. This is a protocol that Windows has for logging into things remotely. Uh, you type in an IP address, a username, a password, and it'll, if RDP is enabled, and if you are in the remote users group, it'll let you, you know, use a mouse and a keyboard and see the screen and that kind of thing. And it's nice to use. Uh, but there are vulnerabilities. 
And it also does make you a higher privileged user if you're logging in with the GUI than if you logged in through like SSH or if you exploited something and got a shell. Uh, questions about that? Yes? So they have, Windows has these things called integrity levels. And uh, process, basically it's like, if you are an interactive user, you can do more stuff. If you are not an interactive user, like a service shouldn't be interacting with things, you cannot do certain stuff. Um, so sometimes things are easier to exploit via the GUI, not just because buttons are easier, but because you have more permissions, sometimes. Uh, this is, remember, like everything in this talk is basically so that I can teach you how to hack it on Monday and how to defend it on Tuesday. So just kind of keep it in mind. And that's it. Other questions? Yeah. There are ways. You can do this thing called process migration where you can inject stuff into another process. I'll probably talk about that on Tuesday, but you know it's harder, right? And sometimes it's not possible. Microsoft has gotten really good at this recently where they've been making processes more secure, they're making processes protected such that you cannot inject code into them and become higher integrity. So it's becoming harder and harder and my job is becoming less and less relevant, uh, but you know, we'll see. I say that, but pretty much every single company still uses on-premises Active Directory there are, and also has a lot of outdated stuff and misconfigured things. Uh, there's also Azure Active Directory, which is like Active Directory on the cloud, uh, which makes things a little bit harder, but it's still very relevant. Yeah. It's like based... Uh, so the question was, how different is Azure Active Directory? It's pretty much the same thing, just with like extra features including extra security features. Okay. Let's see. Okay, there's two more slides. Uh, so WinRM is one of those ports that is used a lot for Windows Remote Management. That's what it stands for. And it lets you log in through PowerShell remotely. It's primarily an administrator tool. Um, by the way, if you Nmap scan something, it's not going to show up by default because it's not a top 1,000 common port. Uh, but it does exist by default on domain controllers. And by default, if you are a local administrator, you can log into a machine through Windows Remote Management, Windows RM, and you can execute code as a high integrity user. Uh, it's basically like SSH, but it's PowerShell. Uh, by default, all the stuff when you send authenticate is not encrypted. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good tool to have. Questions about that? Okay, uh, last protocol, last slide, uh, is remote procedure call. The reason this is last is because it's not that important, to be honest, but it's, it's kind of the backbone of Windows. It's like a thing that happens in the background that you never think about, but this is what happens when you do literally everything. When you log in, when you access a file share, when you open a Word document that has an embedded PowerPoint in it, uh, that's all happening through RPC, which is basically this thing that lets you remotely tell the computer to do something, right? You might have heard of how there were a ton of vulnerabilities in Windows a few years ago in the print spooler, the thing for queuing up things to print. That was a vulnerability with essentially RPC with the print service. There was an endpoint that you could request that could allow you to basically hack, <laughs> uh, exploit the machine. Uh, and RPC is one of those services that is very high privilege because it's really old and the developers didn't think about security. Um, but it is the backbone of everything in Windows. As a result, it's also constantly, constantly, constantly being researched and fuzzed by people. And people are constantly looking for vulnerabilities in it. Um, but yeah, everything uses RPC. Questions about that? Okay, well, that's all I have for you. Uh, as a reminder, this talk is just the introduction to the talks on Monday and Tuesday. On Monday, I'm gonna talk to you about how to hack all things Windows and Active Directory, which is, that is the reason that I've learned Windows in depth. And on Tuesday, I'm gonna talk to you about common attacks and how to defend them.
You know, I mentioned to you that some ticket granting tickets are generated with a expiration of 10,000 hours. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can detect attackers. And there's a lot of other ways that, uh, you know, that attackers forget about that you can use to detect things. Um, yeah. Any questions about anything? Yeah. Uh, Monday and Tuesday are going to be Malakowski 5 to 10 at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I think they're a lot more interesting than what I covered today, but, you know, you have to come to find out. I'm going to try my best to record them and also put them on Zoom. Okay. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.